Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 332, cover dated May 1996. And you can see with this issue that they've returned to the practice of including the issue number in the corner box, uh, whereas previously they were putting it down here with the barcode, um, which made it difficult to see which particular issue of the title it was. So that experiment is over. Now the cover is by John Madureira. Can't see who the inker is here. We've got a little and symbol but um, the inker's name is cut off. I did some research online, can't find out who the inker is but my guess is that it is Tim Townsend who's the inker of Joe Madureira's art in the inside of this particular issue. This cover is not one of my favorites. Um, I have to say that it's probably my least favorite of Joe Madureira's covers from Uncanny X-Men. I don't know if any of you are fans of it out there. And we've got the cover caption, Beware the Hand of Ozymandias. So Cyclops, Phoenix, Wolverine right in the middle with a nail through his nose, Cannonball and Iceman all feature in this issue. So let's open it up to the splash page and something that has happened to Wolverine in issue 100 of his own solo title is that he, minus his adamantium skeleton, has undergone an even more uh, severe mutation than what was hinted at in previous uh, issues where he was becoming more bestial now he's become truly bestial looking and into the bargain in Joe Madureira's version of this new bestial Wolverine he's even missing his nose um, so we've got some um, first person dialogue um, over this image of this bestial Wolverine and it's Professor X who's speaking he's out there somewhere Logan, the X-Man we call Wolverine, is alone. He's hungry, exhausted, disoriented. I want him home now. Title of the story, The Road to Casablanca, because this location where Wolverine is, is Casablanca, Morocco. And the creative team, Scott Lobdell, writer, Joe Madureira, penciler, Tim Townsend, inker, Richard Starkings and Comic Craft on the digital lettering, and Steve Buccellato and his digital coloring team on the colors. So a nice image there, nice uh, colors there from Buccellato, like the uh, cold breath of Wolverine there in the cold of the desert nighttime. Let's continue with the story. So Wolverine is being trailed by someone who's wearing ninja type gear in red um, and who we see here wields a sigh and is a woman. It's Elektra that's following him. So Elektra is back from the dead in the Marvel Universe. Um, Frank Miller, he says he had a gentleman's agreement with Marvel that they wouldn't use Elektra um, without his involvement. So this was something that um, deeply annoyed him um, in the mid 90s when Marvel brought Elektra back, uh, making the point that um, Miller signed her over to them, that she was their intellectual property and they could do that if they, if they wanted to. Um, so first, the professor's first person dialogue continues in a moment of se severe crisis he was forced to shed the last vestige of his humanity so this is a little summary of what happened in Wolverine number 100 a captive of the mad boy called Genesis Wolverine felt the only way to save his teammate Cannonball his sole recourse in preventing the genetic overlord apocalypse from once again grabbing a foothold over the human race was to give himself both body and soul to the animal within until I have a chance to examine him to assess the amount of damage done to him during his battle against the Dark Riders I cannot say with any certainty if Wolverine will ever truly be human again I want to find him before anyone else does and so that's all juxtaposed with this mysterious figure who I said is Electra that's trailing him and so he gets catches a whiff that someone is trailing him but she's a ninja and she's hidden from him. And um, there you go, that's our opening scene. And we get to see here, I'm going to have a little complaint, which is that this bestial version of Wolverine does have nostrils, but you can't see them, like Madurair is not drawing them. So okay, artistic license, fine, but he is supposed to be able to um, use his sense of smell. So where are the nostrils is what I want to know. Um, a little bit of artistic license too far, at least for me. And then here we see where the professor is and he's talking to this agent of Landau, Luckman and Lake, the inter interdimensional um, agency um, that Wolverine has had dealings with 
for many, many decades. That was established by Claremont in issue 257 of Uncanny X-Men. Um, so this woman, Ms. Culloden, is speaking to the professor and she's saying, I hope you do find Wolverine, Professor Xavier, but I'm afraid I can't help you. You may or, not, may or may not be aware of this, but my employers um, have a, a business relationship with Logan that significantly predates his tenure as an X-Man. Because of the sensitive nature of the ventures in which we're involved, you understand I have to cite client attorney privilege, but the professor here, who in many issues since uh, the end of the Age of Apocalypse has been shown in deep shadow or silhouette, says, I'm afraid I haven't made myself clear on this matter, Ms. Culloden. So something's up with the professor and outside the building, someone who's twigged to it is the first X-Man, the first um, uh, trainee of the professor. It's Scott Summers. He knows that something's up. The professor continues there again in shadow. I like that. I like the way that um, the blacks have been spotted by Madarera and inked in by Townsend. Um, the professor continues, you're working under the misconception that I came here to ask for your help. That is not the case, nor am, in, nor am I the least bit interested in the sensitive nature of what you people do here, because he knows all about it, or in the 26 branch offices you've sprinkled about this planet, or those situated throughout any number of alternate dimensions. So she says, she's surprised, do you know about, and he interrupts her and says, allow me to ask the questions, please. So the professor's interrogating her. And um, outside, Jean is using her telepathic powers to try and locate Logan. And that's where Scott says, it's not Landau, Luckman, and Lake I'm worried about. He's worried about the professor. And outside the Rolls-Royce, the professor's Rolls-Royce, nicely drawn by Madarera, nice perspective there. Obviously using um, photo reference for this vintage Rolls-Royce. We've got Cannonball and we've got Iceman. And uh, there's a little bit of a heart-to-heart -heart between Cannonball and Iceman. Cannonball's the newest member of the X-Men, and of course, Bobby Drake, the original team, he was the youngest member of the X-Men. So Scott Lobdell continuing his um, development of Iceman's character, and here it is that Iceman is finding himself um, telling Cannonball to book up um, and trying to cheer him up because he's feeling guilty about what happened to Wolverine when Wolverine was trying to save him in um, issue 100 of his own title. You think you're the only X-Man to ever mess up, says Bobby. Did I ever tell you about the champions? So this is a nice little reference to 70s uh, Marvel Comics by Lobdell here. Picture this, me, the Angel, Black Widow, Hercules and Ghost Rider in LA. Do you have any idea how hard it is to find a major supervillain to fight in Los Angeles? So, Cannonball smiling now, he says, that does sound pretty embarrassing. It's just I'm scared for Logan. You didn't see him, Bobby. He's different. And Iceman thinks to himself there, we're all changing. What's really scary is the days come where I'm the team member doling out advice. That's it, Bobby. Keep your jokes to yourself. So, good stuff from Lobdell in terms of continuing to work on Iceman's characterization um, and moving him beyond being just simply the team's clown. So at this point, Jean is, um, is, has zeroed in on Logan. It's Logan's telepathic e echo, 10 miles south of, and she was going to say Casablanca. And then uh, Cyclops sees that the professor is projecting his astral form. And the professor says, or Cyclops says to the professor, we've located Wolverine will pick you up and that's only half the job Cyclops says the professor you go on ahead I'll be joining you shortly and Cyclops was asking him are you sure but he just interrupts and says go I'll be fine so off they go Cyclops riding on Iceman's slide cannonball blasting there Jean using her TK and in the narrative caption we're told that Cyclops feels it in his gut that things are far from fine so he's got an intuition that something's up with the professor and something indeed is up with the professor. And here, this is an interesting little scene here where Ms. Culloden is ordering a, or getting a drink for the, for the professor from the bar here in her office. And um, she says to him, I forgot who I was talking to, Charles Xavier, the self-proclaimed patron saint of purity. 
thou shalt not drink, smoke, nor use your mutant powers to dominate humanity, right? And he says, my reputation precedes me, but I didn't come here to talk about me. And this is an interesting, um, what would I say, like caricaturing of the professor as a, pa as a saintly type, because really he's anything but at this point in the continuity. So she's there um, arming this weapon on her gauntlet saying, whether you know it or not, uh, you did um, uh, come to talk about himself. Please, Professor, leave now before it's too late. So he grabs her arm. Don't struggle, Xavier. If you truly be believe in this dream of yours, she says to him, if you sincerely want to achieve genetic harmony between the races, you'll end it here now. And she appears to shoot him in the head. So can this have actually happened? Turn the page, no. It was all a psychic simulation. The professor took control of her mind and allowed her to work out, or allowed her to work out what her extreme response would be if he refused to go along with what she wanted him to do. Now I know what you're capable of, he says. Would you like to know what I'm capable of? So, he immobilizes her telepathically and she's sweating there saying, you've decided not to fight fair. You were the one who blew my head off a moment ago. Remember, I'll make this easy. I lost Sabretooth. I will not lose Wolverine. So the professor no longer Mr. Nice Guy anymore. Um, nice use of silhouettes there on this particular page. Of course, it's a time-saving device for the artist not having to draw in backgrounds or all the details of the characters, but aesthetically, it looks good. Let's continue here. And then we've got a scene switch back to Morocco. And we're following Wolverine, who is pretty much nonverbal in this uh, mutated bestial form. And we're told in the narrative captions, for him, it's no longer about right and wrong. It's about curiosity and, for better or for worse, the satiation of the same. So his curiosity gets the better of him and he steps on this trap and down he goes. And here we see Elektra just sighs with frustration, much to the consternation of the shadow cloaked observer. One mile below, we have this character, Ozymandias, a new character um, named for the ancient Egyptian pharaoh, um, memorialized most famously in the poem by uh, uh, P.B. Shelley, um, Ozymandias, King of Kings. And he talks to himself, he's been down there um, millennia imprisoned by apocalypse as it will turn out so he's talking to himself there um, saying for sunset upon sunset piled high one on top of the other the former king has set his blind eyes his stone hands to a singular task to fending off madness but today today the burden of solitude is broken today Ozymandias's company Ozymandias is aghast for has he been exiled for so long that the very face of humanity has changed as Wolverine lands one mile down on the ground. And I like the little trail of dust there set off by his landing as well. That's a nice little detail in the art. And this is an interesting page um, with this design of these columns that Ozymandias has been um, chiseling away at and creating these kind of bas relief um, sculptures. So he says, again, as with every time before it, Ozymandias is left with questions. Was he such a horrible king that he should suffer so for so long? Or was his only transgression that he dared oppose apocalypse? Why has Ozymandias' vision been replaced with images, images of a world that cannot be? Apocalypse is a cruel captor indeed, for the only way for Ozymandias to free himself of his visions is to record them, to etch them in stone. So we can see them here, and this looks a lot like Wolverine here with these claws and here he is fighting some creature with a long tail and he's fighting someone else there and someone else again and all the way down. Um, so intriguing what is going on there and what it might portend. And again, you can see no real nostrils there on bestial Wolverine's face. And now I've got to turn this one to the side so you can get the full shot of Ozymandias there. We get a good look at him. And he continues and says, or has Ozymandias simply finally gone mad when last he walked the earth above 
Man was neither fish nor fowl, nor rock nor flame. Man was simply man. But this creature before him bespeaks another age of humanity, much like the image of men, of entire cities falling from the sky, of spirits being plucked from the ether to the now, impossibilities, atrocities, blasphemies. Tell me, beseeches Ozymandias of the creature who would be a man, tell me why you are here. Answer for me the thousand thousand mysteries which plague me through the eternal night. Answer me lest I tear the answers from your very soul. Okay, so all of that, in truth, could have been handled in one page, but instead we have this double page spread. And it's a pretty nice image of Ozymandias there, looking like a statue. And it gives Madarera and Townsend an opportunity to show off with this stone texture on the character, and also the colorist as well to enhance that um, also. So aesthetically, it's good looking, but not much going on really in terms of the story. And now finally we have the arrival of the X-Men. So they've made their way to Morocco via the Blackbird, I would imagine. And um, Cyclops said, well, let's see what's happening here. So uh, Jean says, look at Logan. Without his adamantium skeleton, he's mutated further than anyone could have guessed. So Cyclops says, I see him, Gene. As bad as he looks, we'll have to worry about Wolverine after we get him out of here. From what we managed to hear, old man, he addresses Ozymandias. It's clear you have as much reason to fear Apocalypse as we do, but he's dead, killed months ago on the moon's surface. So that's the last issue of the Executioner's Song, which is noted there in the footnote, X-Force number 18. There's no reason to fight each other. So Ozymandias flings away his um, hammer, and let's see what happens next. That's a nice anchor image. Cyclops looks pretty good there in particular. Um, let's continue. So now, naturally, we have a fight. And what happens is that Ozymandias is somehow able to bring the images on the walls that he's carved to life. So we've various characters from the X-Men's world here showing up in these stone forms. Everyone from the Blob to Magneto to Wolverine it would appear, or is it a mutated version of Sabretooth? And also X-Man. So, Gene says, Scott, either Apocalypse didn't want the competition of another mutant, or Ozymandias is another human re-engineered along the lines of Mr. Sinister. So this is information regarding Mr. Sinister's backstory that has been recently revealed in the further adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix. Um, so moving far away from what was Claremont's original backstory for Mr. Sinister. Whatever the answer turns out to be, continues Jean, I can tell you I'm not picking up any signs of life within these things. They're nothing but animated stone, which allows me to telekinetically crush this one doppelganger I don't recognize. And that is X-Man there, who is a, um, a, who has arrived, who traveled from the Age of Apocalypse uh, to the prime reality and has been having adventures in recent months in his own title. So Gene here attacked from behind by, is it Sabretooth or is it Wolverine? In any case, the fight continues and Wolverine goes up against this creature and knocks its head off. And then he, the blob is coming up behind him, but the blob is taken out by Cannonball. So some nice fight choreography here. Um, interesting choices too, aesthetically, to have the characters mostly in silhouette in this panel and to have an open border panel at the bottom of the page there. Some other era varying the layouts, which keeps things visually interesting. And let's continue where we've got Iceman getting involved in the fight. And of course, he's been developing his powers of late and he's done something interesting now. He says, uh, they're ready, Psych, because they aren't alive. They didn't realize I was dropping their internal temperature to the point where, and Cyclops gets it, where I can shatter them with a single optic blast. So the team, with the teamwork, they take out a couple of those stone creatures, but here comes the Wolverine one launching at them, and he manages to cut Iceman's ice slide, and Cyclops falls all the way down into that well. So he's falling away, and in the narrative captions, we're told one member of the team or another 
would have been there to assist them, but not everyone is working to their full capacity. And the creature known as Ozymandias is much faster than anyone expected. So he grabs Wolverine and Stone Magneto has grabbed Jean as well, but we didn't see that in the art. I feel this, uh, these last couple of pages, a lot happens in them. And I think that that double page spread earlier could have been used in order to clarify. We need one more page here for what's happening. The fact that Magneto, uh, Stone Magneto, has got Jean. How did that even happen when she was able to use her TK to smash the other ones? It seems contrived. And Ozymandias is preparing to drop Wolverine down the well after Cyclops 2. So here Jean thinks, can barely breathe, can't concentrate enough to free Wolverine or presumably catch Cyclops with her telekinesis and what's going to happen to Scott. Ah, you know, it's hard to believe this when um, Jean Grey is an Amiga level mutant. Um, so she should be well, well able to have handled all of this. But in any case, it's required for the storyline. And what I don't like too is the fact that the story is concluded in Wolverine 101. So around this time, really Bob Harris was setting things up in such a way that you couldn't follow these stories without picking up multiple titles. Um, and I don't think that that was right at the time. And I think there was people um, complaining about it too at the time. Um, and I think they were right. You know, you should have been able to get, aside from a big event, you should have been able to get the conclusion of stories um, in the title that you're following, the single title that you're following. Because in the next issue, they're going to introduce an X-Men villain that will change the face of the Marvel Universe forever. Right, so some hyperbole there. The letters page, letters about issue 329, which was another Joe Madureira issue. And in particular, a lot of praise for the digital effects in that um, comic with the Steam Ninja. And um, here we have next month, Why Cyclops meeting with Senator Kelly? What could possess Phoenix and Gambit to break into the Pentagon? And who is the man called Bastion? Find out next month. So more build up for Onslaught in next month's issue. Editorial information there about all the different titles. You can see many, many titles, uh, 12 titles to pick up in the one month. Um, quite a lot, to be honest. And um, there we go, an ad for Ascani Sun, a new four issue cable limited series by Scott Lobdell and Gene Ha. So Scott Lobdell really spread thin across the X Universe titles at this time period. Um, I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X Men 332. Uh, let me know your thoughts on this issue in the comment section to the video. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.